Um, welcome to this talk by the Center for Philosophical Studies of History. My name is Georg Angel. I will be today's moderator. Today's speaker is um, Mariana Eimers Scheinbaum um, with the topic, The Narrative Sublime on Freedom and Construction of the Past. Um, Mariana is currently a postdoctoral um, fellow at the Institute for Philosophical Research at the National Autonomous University of Mexico. She has obtained her uh, PhD last year at the University of California, Santa Cruz, under the um, um, supervision of Paul Roth. Um, Mariana's research interests lie in narrative, as can be also witnessed by the title of today's topic, uh, talk. Um, and here, especially in the, um, cog the, the, the cognitive value and epistemic value that narratives have, and in the way narratives are used in the construction of personal and social identities. Um, Mariana's most recent publications are Principles of Narrative Reason in History and Theory and um, The End of Histories, question mark, um, a review essay on Alexander Rosenberg's newest book, written um, co-authored together with Paul Roth and which was published in the Journal of the Philosophy of History. Both of these were published last year, 2021, and I encourage you to have a look at them. Um, we're also very happy to have uh, Mariana here today topic-wise. Um, in our research seminar, we haven't really heard about the sublime before, either in narrative or any other kind of fashion. Um, now, the sublime, of course, has been, at least in the past, a certain discussion point in the philosophy of history. I'm not sure if it is now at the moment very much anymore. I'm thinking here, for instance, about um, Frank Ankersmith's book, uh, Sublime Historical Experience. Now, if it is not a big discussion point at the moment anymore, maybe after this talk today and after um, Mariana's work on the topic, it will be again a discussion point, or hopefully it will be again. Um, now, before I give the word to Mariana, two, two, two quick points. Um, this is the second session in our spring seminar. We will have two more sessions, one in April, one in May. Um, in April, actually in two weeks time, of the two weeks ahead now today, the 14th of April, we will have Wolf Kansteiner speaking on the topic um, Meta Holocaust, a multi-directional theory of history. And um, in May, on the 26th of May to be precise, um, Kalle Pichlenen will speak on history and parahistory. Now, for more information on these events and anything else we do, um, please look at our homepage and consider following our social media accounts. Actually, um, on social media, we publish also what else we do in a very timely fashion, so it's well recommended to check that out regularly. Now, before I give the word to um, Mariana, technicality is the last point. Um, please mute yourself during the talk to avoid um, unnecessary disturbance. And Mariana also told me just before that she would like that she likes to see faces when she talks. So consider um, turning your camera on. And then um, after the talk, there will be a discussion session. In the discussion session, um, if you have a comment or a question, uh, please first indicate so in the chat. I will make a speakers list. Then um, when it's your turn to speak, you can either speak up, uh, speak up, yeah, with your with or without your camera on, or you can type your question in the chat and then I will read it out. Um, we will and we will prioritize people who have not spoken yet. So if you haven't, then you will move up the speakers list. Now, I'm finished. That was it for me. Thank you again, Mariana, for coming to our seminar. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the introduction, and really thank you for the invitation. I'm I'm very happy to be presenting this project uh, today. So I'm gonna share my screen with everyone, so you can see the presentation. Can everybody see it? Okay. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, well, so yeah, um, the project that I'm going to be presenting today is called uh, The Narrative Sublime on Freedom and Construction of the Past. Um, but in light of recent feedback <laughs> that I got, uh, I've realized that this project is, is really big or bigger than I thought at first. So really what I'm going to be presenting today is uh, the construction part of the project, not the freedom part of the project. So I just wanted to sort of highlight uh, that at first. Okay, so I'm, this is the, the structure of the presentation. I first want to motivate the project and talk about two different views that are, 
I believe, current in philosophy of history. So there's the aesthetic view, or what I call the aesthetic view, and the epistemic views. And what I'm going to be arguing in, in the first part of the presentation is that there seems to be a sort of divorce between the aesthetic and the epistemic. Uh, what I'm going to propose is to take a look at the Kantian sublime, to go back to origins, and look at the Kantian sublime to sort of come up with a middle ground between the aesthetic and the epistemic and sort of um, bind them back together, uh, specifically when we're talking about historical uh, explanations. And finally, I'm going to be given my giving my, um, my own account on what I think narrative reason is and a particular account of aspects uh, that I believe is going to, um, to add to this binding together of the aesthetic and the epistemic. So this is the structure and I'm going to start with the first part. So this is a quote from Anne Rigney's uh, Imperfect Histories. And uh, I'm going to read it because I think she's describing a particular feeling that I believe both the aesthetic and the epistemics views actually agree on this. So here's what she says. The historian is confronted with that uncomfortable feeling of from that uncomfortable form of pleasure, that delightful horror that arises from the positive valorization of a confrontation with something that exceeds our capacities to control it or to comprehend it as a totality. The confrontation with something unmasterable is unpleasant in principle. The most appropriate term for describing this particular aesthetic effect is still the sublime. So what Rigney is sort of describing here is um, this idea, right, that the historian is sort of confronted with this unmasterable thing that is the past, right, that is disorganized, that doesn't have meaning uh, by itself. And this sort of confrontation arises this feeling of sublimity, right, this feeling of um, delightful horror, as she calls it. But what is interesting to note, right, is this idea that the past is something that is not structured, something that exceeds our capacities to control it, et cetera. And I believe, right, that this aesthetic feeling that uh, uh, Rigney is describing here can be seen in both the aesthetic and the epistemic views. So when I talk about the uh, aesthetic views uh, within philosophy of history, I'm referring particularly to Haydn White and Frank Anker Smith. So the idea, right, is that both of these authors, um, the answer that they give to this delightful horror, right, how to sort of overcome this delightful horror is by privileging the aesthetic over the epistemic and sort of saying that the imposition that we make to make the past uh, masterable and understandable is an aesthetic imposition, right? So um, White says the following, if anything, this rhetorical element, right, this poetic consciousness that yeah, he also calls it, is even more important, he says, than the logic, the, than the logical one for comprehending what goes into the composition of a historical discourse. So here it's very clear, right, or, or it starts to become clear that there is this sort of ascension or division between the aesthetic and the epistemic, right, and really what the historian does is use the aesthetic to make or give meaning to the past. And what White is saying here is that actually this aesthetic part is more important than the logical or epistemic part. And Anker Smith in the same line, right, uh, of thought says the following, I propose therefore to see the writing of history from the point of view of aesthetics. The suggestion is rather that the historian could meaningfully be compared to the painter representing a landscape, a person, and so on. And here's the important part, right? There is therefore a natural coalition, a natural coalition between history and representation and a natural enmity between this coalition and epistemology. So again, right here, it becomes clear that within this aesthetic view that, I, that I'm calling it, there is really an accession, right? And, and Anker Schmidt even makes it more evident. And he says that there is an actual enmity, right? Between the coalition of history, history and representation on the one hand and epistemology on the other. So there is clearly this division, right? 
So I, I'm not alone in this reading, right, of either White or Ankersmith. Uh, Lawrence and Roth also have this reading, right? So Lawrence says that, you know, epistemology and aesthetics trade places in philosophy of history with this aesthetic view, right? Epistemology up till then regarded as the bread and butter of analytic philosophy, uh, Lawrence says, is thrown out and aesthetics takes its place. And Roth argues that the regulative element for historians is not reason, but the figurative and storytelling language, which belongs to the historian's cultural repertoire. So this just shows that, you know, my reading of White and Anker Smith uh, um, is not, you know, a unique reading, but actually there are other authors that are seeing this decision, right? And so, um, this is on um, sort of the aesthetic side, right? So what's going on on the epistemic side? So the, the other account, right, that says, well, if, if it's not aesthetics, then what is it that allows us to make sense of the past? And so there is this post-narrativist view that uh, argues that, well, it's not necessarily narrative that is binding things together, that is binding events together, but really is more, uh, colligation, right, or colligatory concepts. And really, we shouldn't see historical explanations as narratives necessarily, but we should see them more as um, hypotheses or uh, argumentations for or against a given position. And so Kukanen, here present, <laughs> uh, argues that, you know, rejecting holism means, in effect, abandoning the suggestion that historiography creates products akin to artistic artifacts. The proposal that the main rationale for historiography is to provide argumentative support for the main thesis entails that historiography is a form of rational practice. And here's, here's uh, what's interesting to note, right? In any case, it is clear that the framework for rationality is different from the narrative descriptive. So on the epistemic side, we still have this sort of decision, right, between the aesthetic and the epistemic. It's saying, Narrative is not necessarily the thing that's binding uh, um, events together. It's really, we should start seeing uh, at historical explanations as this sort of uh, rational um, constructions. And so the, the, the whole idea of colligation, right, or colligatory concepts is really a non-aesthetic or a non-narrativist notion, the way that I read it, uh, that aims to explain how narrative, how unity is achieved, right? But there is this sort of underlying, I believe, underlying um, continuity between the aesthetic and the epistemic that is there, those divisions should be kept, right? Um, and and if narratives don't have, if narratives are more aesthetic and not epistemic, then the epistemic view is going to say, well, uh, really historical explanations are a rational, you know, belong to the rational realm, and uh, we should start thinking about them in different ways uh, that are not in aesthetic ways. So these are sort of the two views that I'm. Um, you know, sort of uh, um, posing myself, or this is uh, that I'm going to pose myself um, in this debate. So what, what I believe is interesting to note, right, is that um, the literature towards the sublime in particular has privileged the aesthetic over the epistemic and has argued that, uh, it has sort of been hijacked uh, by the aesthetic view and has said that uh, really the historian overcomes and dominates this feeling of sublimity that Rigney was talking about through implotment or representation. And so what I want to do to sort of find a middle ground between the aesthetic and the epistemic and retrieve the epistemic value of narratives is say, well, we should go back to a more originary use, and that is the Kantian heritage. So I believe that, that in the Kantian heritage of the literature on the sublime, we find an effort to sort of bind together the sublime and the rational and see them as part of, of uh, as a cognitive unity, right? So the sublime in this sense 
is an aesthetic judgment, the way that Kant sees it, right, is an aesthetic judgment that allows us to recognize how reason is key in making an experience understandable. And so I'm, I'm going to go on to the second part of the presentation and talk a, just a little bit about the Kantian sublime and how is it that I'm going to um, sort of um, hijack it now to find this middle ground between the aesthetic and the epistemic. So Kant says in the analytic of the sublime, right, that the beautiful in nature concerns the form of the object, which consists in limitation. The sublime, on the other hand, Kant says, is to be found in a formless object insofar as limitlessness is represented, represented in it. So basically what Kant is saying is that the beautiful and the sublime have a different phenomenology, right? The beautiful concerns the limit of an object, whereas the sublime concerns limitlessness and um, sort of disorganizedness. Um, so, what Khan is going to say, right, is when we are confronted with something that is so vast and so uh, magnificent in nature, such as, you know, this painting that is uh, right here on your right, um, when you're confronted with that vastness, Khan says, is he says, we are left in sort of this moment of not knowing exactly what we are experiencing. And what he says is that that moment uh, provokes in us a feeling of an abyss or a negative pleasure, he calls it. And part of the negative pleasure, the negative side of this pleasure comes because there is, uh, he says, there's something that's provoking a violence to the imagination, Kant says. So what he says is that there is no notion in our understanding, there's no concept in our understanding that can actually allow us to see that vastness and comprehend it in one whole. Rather, what we see is sort of like different parts and we don't know exactly how is it that those parts are bind together. And so what Kant says is that that is sort of a moment where the imagination is sort of, you know, uh, falls short to make us comprehend what we're experiencing. But Kant says, well, you know, there's still, uh, there's still light at the end of the tunnel. And so reason, right, comes in, Kant says, and uh, provides us with ideas that can allow us to actually comprehend what is it that we're seeing. So one of the cognitive uh, activities that reason is performing here, Kant says, is the activity of comprehension, right? So one thing is to apprehend, he says, to see how different parts are there. And another thing is to comprehend, right? To see how all of the, these different parts are uh, come together in a unitary whole. And this is exactly what reason allows us to do. Kant says, to sort of surpass this negative feeling and actually start feeling pleasure because we start comprehending what is in front of us, right? So instead of seeing, you know, this little part of the rock, if you're this monk by the end of the sea, this part of the rock, this part of the horizon, and this part of the ocean, you actually see this as a unified whole. And Kant says that you have, for example, the idea of infinity that allows you to give this a uh, unified meaning. So what is really interesting to note, right, about what Kant is suggesting is how reason here becomes a key player in judging sublimity, because it sort of signals where the mind is imposing structure rather than merely perceiving it. And it's interesting also because Kant is going to say, right, the reason sort of elevates us into surpassing the abyss that we feel, this negative feeling that we first feel, um, and start giving form and limit to what otherwise does not have it, right? And so finally, Kant uh, concludes saying that sublimity is not contained in anything in nature, but only in our mind. Everything that arouses this feeling within us 
that calls forth our own powers is thus called sublime. So it's interesting to note, right? What Kant is going to say is sublimity is not something that it's out there. It's rather a capacity within us, right? That is really linked to reason and the use of reason to give meaning and establish a structure or impose a structure to um, something that does not have it, okay? So that's sort of the way that I'm, or the thing that I'm recuperating from Kant, right? So now let me move to the third part of the presentation, but keep in mind the idea of sublimity because I'm going to be using it um, throughout. So I want to just clarify that um, I'm going also to be using the notion of narrative reason from now on. And the way that I'm understanding narrative reason is, uh, is the same way that I, I propose in, in this article that, uh, that I, I published uh, last year, the Principles of Narrative Reason, right? And so what, one of the things that I'm, that I'm proposing in this article is that um, narrative sort of responds to certain principles that are pretty similar to the ones that Gestalt psychologists proposed at the beginning of the 20th century. So Gestalt psychologists sort of say, hey, when you open your eyes, you see structure in the world and that responds to certain principles. And so what I basically did in this article is say, the same way that we organize space uh, or the principles that help us organize space are the same ones that help us organize time and narrative. So I propose that the principles of foreground, background, continuity, proximity, similarity, and closure are behind the, um, the sort of grid that narrative use or uses to allow us to give meaning to what otherwise does not have it, right? And so what, what I argue in this article is that these principles make experience intelligible by fitting it into a systematic understanding of, of the world. So what I'm basically sort of saying here is that narrative reason is the one that allows us to comprehend in the Kantian sense, right? To see how things are bind together by using these principles that um, you know, go back to uh, the Gestalt psychologist. So I just wanted to clarify this because I'm going to be using the notion of narrative reason and I just wanted to make sure that this is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about narrative reason. So now I, I want to sort of introduce the idea of historical aspects, but not in a way that Anker Smith uses, but in a different way. And so what I'm going to suggest is that aspects allow us to sort of or, or make evident the sort of grid that allows us to impose structure to something that does not have it. And what I'm going to argue is that aspects and narrative reason need to work hand by hand to uh, provide meaning to the past. And so what is it that I refer to as historical aspects? So the way that I'm going to be talking about aspects comes from the Wittgensteinian legacy of seeing as. So what Wittgenstein suggests, right, is that when, when you see something as P, X, Q, most of the times you, you are able to see that something as P, X, Q, because I'm providing you with a particular interpretation that allows you to see that thing as something else, right? So he gives this particular example in RPP, right? He says, well, look at this image of this box, right? And so if I provide you with an interpretation to see this box, right? First as a glass cube, then as a wireframe, or as a lidless open box, or as a three boards making a solid angle, the box has not changed, right? But the interpretation that I'm giving you is different. And therefore, the organization, the way that you're organizing this image, what you bring to the foreground, what you leave in the background, how you're making continuous is also going to change, right? But the idea that Wittgenstein is sort of pressing here is that when we see something as different things, we're clothing that something, and this is his term, right? We're clothing that something with interpretation and organization. 
And so I'm, what I'm basically suggesting, right, is that to overcome this first feeling that I talked about uh, of the sublime, right, of this negative form of pleasure, we need to clothe the past with organization and interpretation. And the organizing part responds to the idea of narrative reason and is sort of um, based on the principles of Gestalt psychology. And the interpretation part comes from aspects. So let me say a little something more about aspects. <clears throat> so the way that I'm going to be referring to aspects from now on is as cognitive standpoints, right? As tools for thought that allows us to navigate efficiently among a rich body of information and provided with a unitary whole. It sort of brings together facts from which there is no prior framework, right? And so what I'm going to be arguing is that the historian can base understanding by both right, interpreting and organizing. And I argue that organization, as I just I, I said previously, comes from the idea of narrative reason. And so what I aim to show here by, by combining narrative reason and aspects is how the aesthetic and the epistemic are working together. And finally, right, um, what I really want to sort of press here, and this is important to keep in mind, is that historical aspects are not constrained to one type of methodological exercise. Rather, they really are cognitive possibilities, or they should be understood as cognitive possibilities that take attribution of meaning as its central task. So here's exactly what I'm uh, trying to refer to when I talk about aspects. I'm going to be, give, be, be giving two examples. So the first one is E.P. Thompson, The Making of the English Working Class. So you might say, well, class consciousness is this aspect, right, this concept that is allowing us to bind all of these different parts together. But what I really want to sort of press here is that, yes, that could be right. Class consciousness is this sort of aspect that is allowing us to see how things are bind together. But that's not the whole story, right? We need narrative reason, we need organization to see how this interpretation is actually taking place. So we need to see, for example, how the popular traditions that influence the Jacobin agitation in 1790 and the experience of the group of workers uh, at the wake of the new industrial regime after the industrial revolution are working together, right? And how the Napoleonic Wars are also sort of in play here and the configuration of pavilion radicalism, the role of the Methodist church, et cetera, right? We need to see how all of these things are sort of uh, being connected, right? In a narrative, in a story to see actually how, how the, the aspect of class consciousness makes sense, right? So it's not just the idea of using class consciousness, but it's how exactly is it that class consciousness makes sense to use in this particular narrative, right? And so we need the narrative part. We cannot just use the, 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 the conceptual part, let's say. We need that narrative to show us how that concept came to be used or why is it that that concept makes sense to be used. Right, so the idea is that um, class consciousness can be used or is used at this interpretive, interpretive lens but again, right, the concept does not give us a recipe for writing how the English working class came to be constituted as a class. And it's really interesting, right, because even Thompson suggests this. So he says at the, in the preface of his book, he says the following, right? I emphasize that it is class, an historical phenomenon. I do not see class as a structure, not even as a category, but as something which in fact happens and can be shown to have happened in human relationships. So the way that I'm reading here, Thompson is just suggesting, listen, class is not this abstract concept. It's not this structure that is allowing us to sort of um, bind all these different parts together. Really what class consciousness or the way that I'm portraying class consciousness, Thompson might say, is as a historical phenomenon, which means it's a story, right? And it's a story that needs to be told how class consciousness came to be constituted as, as a class, as class consciousness, right? So what, I, what I'm basically arguing is that this aspect, right, of class consciousness, the richness of using it 
is to show how we actually achieved or reached this conclusion, right? So it's in historical explanations, it's not just the conclusion for the sake of the conclusion. It's not just seeing, you know, the English working class was constituted as a class and was present in that constitution, that's great, but show me how that actually came to be, right? And so that is the narrative part. So what I'm basically arguing is that the richness of historical explanations is to show how a conclusion came to be reached, not the conclusion itself. So here's another example, right? And this is actually different from Thompson's example because with Thompson, you can say, well, we have this aspect, we have class consciousness, this sort of binding everything together. But in this other case, um, in Ginsburg, case, uh, Carlo Ginsburg and, and you know, his famous book, The Cheese and the Worms, it's actually less clear what is binding the narrative together, what is binding the story together, right? Because it, at least for me in my reading, there is not really clearly a concept that is articulating the, the explanation as a whole. Rather, um, and this becomes evident in different interviews that, uh, that Ginsburg gave, right? What is sort of binding the narrative together is this, um, is Ginsburg trying to understand basically the, the popular consciousness before the industrial revolution. And in particular, right, what he's trying to understand is how is it that, you know, um, dominant and subordinate classes have this sort of circularity between the production of culture. There was, there was this sort of thesis that says that uh, the dominant classes were the ones that produced uh, culture and subordinate classes just sort of took that and made their own thing. And Ginsburg is trying to go against that and say, no, 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 it's rather a circularity, right? And this is what's sort of motivating uh, the book, The Cheese and the Worms. But what is really interesting to note, right, in this book, different from Thompson, again, is that there is no sort of con concept that's binding things together. It's rather this aspect, this sort of framework that it's larger than just a concept that is allowing us to see, right, how different parts are being pu put together, how comprehension is achieved. So Ginsburg starts, for example, by introducing the main character of the cheese and the worms, this Miller, Minocchio, right? And the idea that he had of the origins of the world. And, you know, it's, it's a very particular uh, uh, idea because he thought that the world was produced out of rotten matter instead of, you know, coming from divinity. And so the idea is, well, how did he actually come up with this idea, right? How, what happened here? And so Ginsburg goes into understanding uh, the books that this character re read, the interaction between oral and written culture, trying to understand where did this character learn how to read because it was weird that you know, Millers in the 16th century knew how to read and write. So what kind of books did he read, right? The conception of religious materialism that Minocchio actually incorporated into his worldview, the trials of the Inquisition, et cetera, right? So all of these things are sort of being bind together to not only explain the life of this particular character, right? But to explain more broadly how the circularity between dominant culture and subordinate classes actually functions, yeah? So with these examples and, and this uh, second example, what I wish to show is that the idea of aspects uh, seek not just to communicate factual information, but to suggest a way of thinking about historical inquiry and explanation, right? There are these sort of lenses uh, that allow us to start unifying what otherwise is not unified. And in Ginsburg example in particular, right, there is not necessarily this concept that is binding the narrative together, rather we have a framework that guides inquiry and provides us with a particular perspective. And so to sort of close the presentation and start, you know, rather talking about it and discussing it, I want to suggest, you know, three, three things. First of all, is that aspects, this idea of interpretation or how interpretation is produced in historical explanations is 
historical aspects can be seen as cognitive gestalts. And this is a, a term coined by Elizabeth Camp in, in a very recent article. And I really like this, and it's very appropriate to what I'm actually I'm trying to say, right? Aspects can be seen as these cognitive gestalts that organize and interpret an array of information that in itself does not hold a coherent structure. They allow us to navigate efficiently among a dispersed body of information and experiences. And so the sublimity of narrative, right? The sublimity of narrative consists in its ability to provide us with a framework and constructing a story that shows how that framework came to be and how that framework actually makes sense. And so the aesthetic pattern, right? The aesthetic pattern making and the cognitive epistemic activity what I'm trying to suggest here is there are two sides of the same coin, right? You can't really just tear them apart, but you need both of them to actually achieve uh, historical explanations and to see the value or the epistemic value of narratives. And so I'm going to finish here to uh, make the conversation part, um, um, I don't know, longer. <laughs> so that's it. Okay. Thank you very much, Mariana for your presentation and for your talk. Okay, yes, um, we are now in the discussion and question phase. So is there anybody who immediately wants to raise a question or have a comment? I can also give anybody, everybody, a, a minute or two. Well, I'll I'll give everybody a minute or two to think about. Um, and then I'll, as, as, as I'm, I'm taking off my head of moderator shortly now and just ask quickly a question uh, to, 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 to the end of your um, presentation on, on the Ginsburg part. Um, so in a sense, you're saying that um, Ginsburg's framework, sort of this, his understanding that, um, that it was not just uh, elite culture, it was sort of put down onto the onto the common people um sort of the that is also sort of is also a narrative or it's also it has at least the setting of the setting of a narrative or can be understood as narrative could you clarify this a bit because it's obviously something different still it's a theoretical framework or a theoretical thesis maybe it's more like a thesis in the sense of what um yoni mati thinks a thesis is a historical thesis um then it is a, a narrative in the sense maybe of 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 Thompson, other examples, or and, and, and in the narrative, in the more and more received sense, in which I would use narrative, at first happened this, then happened that, and that's like a story. And I would say there's also a causal connection between them, but that is something additional, maybe. So maybe you could clarify in what sense, in your understanding of narrative, is um, uh, Ginsburg's what you also call framework or a theoretical understanding also narrative. Thank you. And then I think we have another yeah. question afterwards, already. So I was successful. <laughs> Please. Yeah, um, sh should I answer or, or should uh, I? I think we, uh, we usually we go one by one. Okay. So unless you want to hear another question. No, I think it's good. Okay. Uh, otherwise I'm gonna forget. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah, exactly. So the way that I'm, I'm understanding narratives are um, as stories, right? They, they really tell us how and why something happened. Um, they're really just sort of linking events to explain an outcome. So in the case of Ginsburg, right, the idea is that this relationship can be understood, can be understood, right? The, the relationship between the, uh, the uh, upper culture and the lower culture, let's say, I, I hate these terms, but the upper and the lower culture, right? What he says is a way to understand how this dynamic occurs is by looking into the life of this particular Miller. Right. And how this particular Miller sort of shows us how this dynamic happens. And so the way that he tell us, you know, this larger framework is through the life of this particular individual. And so he is telling us a story right about how this bigger picture happens, but he is sort of concentrating in just this particular person. So what he's sort of suggesting is that this relationship can be also understood in terms of a story, right? And maybe he would even push further and say, should be understood in terms of a story, right? Of this particular individual. Um, thank you very much. We have two questions now, which is great. Um, 
first, Henrika Hanola, please. Thank you. Um, uh, my question might be a bit, I mean, it's very similar to Gerd's question, and uh, but it might be a bit naive because I work mostly on the 19th century debates. So um, that's why I like, especially with the, the question of narrativity, a bit sort of out of my, uh, uh, like my scope. Um, but um, so yeah, going to the Kinsberg question or so I, why, why do you want like why should it be understood as a narrative or as a story and not as sort of a structural um analysis of how this sort of a certain kind of person kind of could exist or how sort of a you see like you could also because how you um explained like Ginsburg's approach is that you sort of he takes this one individual as a starting point and sort of tries to reconstruct kind of all the influences that come and are at play in his life mm -hmm. and you could also just understand that as a kind of a structural kind of understanding i mean this this is now piggybacking a little bit from the 19th century discussions because there were actually a lot of interesting sort of similarities um to so to your um so approach though I, I was very interested in that and on that point um just a comment um I mean, you used, you used the Kantian sub, sublime as kind of an operative uh, word, but another Kantian thing that you might want to look into is Einbildungskraft, so uh, historical imagination, because mm -hmm. that was actually used a lot in the 19th century discussions, mm -hmm. and exactly in this context of trying to sort of um, navigate the historical, the, kind of the artistic um, elements of historiography and the scientific ones. So. So that's just a comment, but yeah, more about the narrativity part. I'm just pushing you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Um, so when you when you actually read uh, the cheese and the worms, you're reading sort of like a biography, right? It's really a story that you're reading, and it starts by telling you, you know, I think it starts with the first trial of the Inquisition that Menocchio went through, and then sort of Ginsburg takes it from there. But what he's really sort of conveying is just the life of this individual, right? It's not the structural analysis between uh, upper and lower classes, but he's just telling you, listen, in the life of this individual, you can actually see how this structure is taking place. But what I'm going to tell you is just the story of the life of this individual, right? So the way that his particular historical explanation is working is through the biography of Menocchio, right? And it's in the life of this character that you can see this other interplays, right? But it's really just a story, right? He's telling us a story about this individual. And then I don't know if that sort of answers the first question. And I, I do want to comment about the idea of historical imagination because it's something that people have told me, you know, what about imagination here? Uh, doesn't it, isn't it playing, you know, a big role? And the thing with imagination is that it's sort of this black box, I think, in philosophy, you know, you don't know how something works and you say it's imagination and people have so many different versions of what imagination is. So actually Kant has this idea of the synthetic imagination. And he says that the synthetic imagination is the one that is actually you know, doing this job of seeing how different parts are being bind together. So if we're talking about that type of imagination, what Kant says is it's not that imagination, it's not present right, in this articulation. It's just that it's sort of at first, it falls short and it needs the aid of reason to sort of move to this synthetic um, operation. But there's other accounts of imagination, for example, Collingwood. And I think uh, Collingwood's idea of historical imagination here sort of falls short. Uh, I don't mean to say that it's not present, but it just sort of falls short, right? Collingwood says that, you know, when you're reading or you're faced with an archive and you're sort of you see Caesar at one point and then at another, and you're, you're sort of asking yourself, how did he get to point A to, from point A to point B, right? How did that happen? And so Collingwood says, you use imagination, imagination to sort of create continuity between point A and point B. And I'm not saying that that is not present, that's present. But the idea is that 
the story is more complicated, right? It's not just getting from point A to point B, it's actually creating a narrative that has a foreground and a background, a proximity and similarity, a closure, right? And continuity is part of that, but it's not just, you know, it's not the whole story. So I think it really just depends on, on, on the definition of imagination that we're working with, right, too. Yeah, but thank you. Thank you very much. Yoni Mati, you're next. Yeah, thank you. Thanks so much for the talk. I'm, I'm in a way continuing the uh, same line of um, asking questions. So, more specifically, I'm interested in the relation of the um, gestalt and narrative structure. And first of all, I think it's a very good idea to uh, relate the idea of uh, reason or rationing to to organization organizing principles. I think that's, that's an interesting way to go. Um, but what I'm um, a bit unsure is how these principles that you put under the Gestalt um, um, concept, how are they actually uh, related to narrativity or narrativizing? Um, I, I think you have such values like, for example, proximity and similarity and foreground, background and others too. And um, if I think about some of them, if not all of them, some of them on the top of my head, it seems that they are not necessarily narrativizing tools at all, like similarity or dissimilarity. My, um, you know, pieces of furniture here, my desk is similar to my chair, but more dissimilar to uh, my pen or whatever. So it doesn't seem to be a very narrativizing feature. Um, so that, that that's my really question here to start with: is uh, how are they? Are they are they necessarily narrativizing? Um, and um, um, something that brings to my mind: um, that if you if you argue for narrativity, so is is, is perhaps the relation that you find uh, that historians narrativize, and then their narratives entail these notions. Or is it something, in fact, something stronger, which I don't see that, you know, they are not narrative making or uh, narrative construction, constructing features. Yeah, th thank you. Um, so here's, here's the idea. Um, when you, you know, what Gestalt psychologists say is that, as I was uh, sort of, uh, suggesting in the talk, right? When you open your eyes, you see spaced structure in a way, as you were saying, right? Or you see at your couch and you say, my couch is similar to this other one, or it's dissimilar. And I don't, what, you know, Gestalt psychologists don't call that narrative. And I don't call that narrative, right? But what I do say is that these principles can sort of illuminate the way that we impose structure when we're talking about time, not space, right? I think, you know, talking about narrativization of space, I don't, I don't even know how to begin to talk about that, right? But what, what I am suggesting in the principles of narrative reason is that these principles are the sort of grid that narrative uses to start forming or to start structuring uh, a story, right? So the first thing that you do when you structure, structure a story, for example, is you bring something to the foreground, right? You have a character, you have a question, you have a concept, you have something that you're searching for, right? And so you bring that to the foreground and that's, that becomes the thing to be explained, right? And so everything else that's sort of like in the background is helping you to sort of understand why that thing is the way that it is, right? And so <clears throat> the way that I'm talking about Gestalt principles in narrative are in this, is in this way, right? Is that they're the grid making structure that allow us to sort of bind different parts together, right? As I was saying, right? It's, it's the way that we link events together if we can even talk about events, right? But it's the way that we sort of link happenings together. Um, and then, um, I don't know if that sort of answers the first question. And then can you repeat the second one, please? 
Um, I'm not, <laughs> I think it's all, all of the same. What What did I actually ask? Second question. I, I, did I Did I ask? Anyway, it's about asking the the relations. Okay. But maybe I can put it this way. Maybe you can confirm or decline. Mm -hmm. is, is it then that the um, one can be one can be gestalt or use gestalt tools um, without narrativization, like in space? Yeah. But one can. But when one narrativizes, then one really nearly uses gestalt. Tools. That's right. That's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. Thank okay. You. Great. No, um, are there any further questions? Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, yeah, Paul, and you just rose, you raise your hand. There's nobody else, please. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, no, I, I'd like to get Mariana into some trouble. I wanted to ask her um, a little bit about how she sees or thinks of the difference between um, aspect perception and the Gestalt principles and colligation. Um, and I'm, I'm tempted to say that, uh, just to see if I can get a rise out of Johnny, uh, uh, that colligation is, is in a way more passive. It's, it's not a narrativizing act. It's sort of uh, Johnny Maddy's uh, Cold War, the, the Thaw, or something like that, where you, um, as you've been emphasizing, talk more about um, uh, organizing events over time in the way that the original Gestaltists talk about them organizing them in space. In any case, I, I just wanted to, you know, and maybe there, there isn't a tension here. I just wanted to, to understand a little more than I do the, the relationship between colligation and aspect perception. Yeah, no, thanks, Paul. Thanks um, for the question. So I think that uh, the idea of colligation, like I'm not, I'm not against it at all, right? And I think aspects can be informed by the idea of colligation, right? But I think there's two things that make a difference here. The first one is that it seems that colligation is sort of referring almost exclusively, although there might be um, instances where not, to concepts, right? To a particular concept. And what I want to do with aspects is sort of broaden that idea. It's not just a concept, right? It could be a question. It could be a framework. It could be uh, uh, a concept even, but it's not just reduced to that, right? It's, it's more than that. And the other thing that I'm, I think I'm adding to this is that aspects need narratives right it's not just the it's not just that an aspect is giving us a recipe on how to apply that to a particular case right but we need a narrative to see how that aspect becomes in a way unique in this particular story right so if you use the idea of revolution as an aspect right it's not giving you a recipe to and how to use it, right? You need actually the story to tell you why the idea of revolution actually makes sense and how that idea is being applied in this particular unique way. So I don't know if that answers, Paul. All right, maybe it does. Oh, he can, he can, he can, he can say something again if it doesn't. Is there anybody else who has a question um, or who wants to say something? I mean, oh yeah, sorry, that was um, Tina, right? You raised your hand, sorry, just sorry. Yes, please, thank, please. You very, thank you very much. Um, just a very simple question. Uh, I paid attention to, to how you used the paintings of Caspar David Friedrich in your presentation. Could you tell a little bit more? Because is there some particular reason for that? Yeah. Um... Well, he, he is, you know, I mean, I, I really like his paintings, but what he's trying to do is represent the sublime, right? This is one of his uh, main tasks. And so in most of his paintings, he is really trying to represent people being really, really tiny and this landscapes being just ginormous and vast and you know just immense and infinite right and so what he's really trying to do is represent that feeling of of just being sort of 
left in the state of abyss, right? When confronted with that uh, massiveness. So that's why I sort of brought them because I, I think it's, it's this feeling that Rigney is trying to convey, right? In, in the first part of the presentation of this negative feeling, this uh, delightful horror that we face when we study the past. Yes, um, thank, you. thank you. Does that answer your question? Yes. Is there any other question for the moment? Um, well, <coughs> I would I would have another question. I guess this, and maybe we don't need to go on endlessly, but if I'll give all of you still uh, some chance to think about something else, um, another question. Um, my question would be again um, on the path, on the on exactly on the role the aesthetic and maybe the sublime mm. place in all of this. Maybe I didn't fully understand mm. it. Mm. Um, is, is what you call the imposing of structure, is that an aesthetic um, mm. process? Because I, I'm fully on board that, that, that narratives have epistemic value and they have to serve an epistemic purpose. Is, is the imposing of structure and now an aesthetic or epistemic process? Maybe it's both probably and you can't, you can't uh, uh, put them apart, but then the question is why can't you put them apart? And then sort of just um, as a follow up on this, on this uh, uh, imposing the structure on something that, that has none, I know this is a common position, but it's also a question that I always ask myself in historical ontology. Um, how, how far does that claim go? What does the claim exactly mean? I know somebody like Anker Smith says the, 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 the past is a chaos, maybe it's something different than imposing a structure before it has been narrativized and so forth. I guess you want to say more than just that because the past is past, it's not present anymore. Therefore, it doesn't have structure, and we have evidence of the past. And by that evidence, you might find the real structure if there was one of the past. That's not what you mean, right? You mean something more strong than that in terms of a certain anti realism or irrealism about historical ontology, right? And maybe that, maybe that relates also to the aesthetic, or maybe it doesn't. So maybe it's two questions, or it's one or two. Take them as you want or put them together if you like. So, that are my questions. Thanks. Yeah, yeah. No, no, this, this is great because this is, you know, when I, when I finished the presentation, I was like, Man, I really hope that the aesthetic part is coming through here. So I, I'm, I'm glad that you're asking this question. And this gives me the opportunity to sort of clarify it better. So yes, what I'm trying to say is that the cognitive and the aesthetic cannot be separated, right? But if you want to sort of press me on, on the aesthetic side and say, well, how exactly can we see the aesthetic part here working? I would have two answers, right? The first one would be, um, a Kantian answer, <laughs> and it would be, you know, Kant says that um, what is what is really incredible about artists and and art is that they can present ideas such as you know the infinity, God, universe, the sublime, and make them sensible, right? Make them sensible to experience, and this is something that I also want to argue for historical narratives, right? The idea of revolution, democracy, freedom. Um, I believe that historians actually, you know, um, present these concepts or present these ideas and they make them sensible to us in a unique way. So that's on the one hand, and that's part of the aesthetic value of historical narratives. And then the other answer to that question would be going back to, you know, aestheticians from the 50s. Uh, so Kendall Walton and Frank Sibley, you know, have these texts, categories of art and aesthetic concepts, and they talk about these categories, right, such as tension, mystery, serenity, sloppiness, etc., as aesthetic categories that we use to both construct and appreciate works of art. And they both talk, right, uh, Walton uses the category of harmony, and Sibley uh, uses the idea of seeing how things hold together as aesthetic categories. And what I'm saying is that this idea of harmony, this idea of seeing how things hold together is the aesthetic part, but it's also the cognitive, right? It's also the, the epistemic part. You cannot sort of divide these two because the way that you're achieving harmony is through you know, this cognitive uh, activity that is informed by gestalt and aspects. Um, and so, I'm sorry, the, the other question about historical ontology, well, it was, I mean, it, 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 it was just something that you sort of mentioned in passing, but I was asking, um, I guess I was asking if you believe that 
the structure that are imposed via the narrative or maybe via aesthetic forms, um, is the old structure that they are to the past? Maybe that's the question. Do you, do you believe that the past is structured before it has been narrativized? Maybe that's another question. Maybe that would be another yeah. way of putting it. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, exactly. So no, the past, you know, is, is not structured, has no meaning by itself, right? It's rather something that we do to the past. It's, it's this activity and sort of the idea of aspects is sort of bringing that uh, uh, in a more tangible way, right? How exactly is it that we're making sense of the past? Well, we apply this interpretation and we apply a particular organization to make sense out of it, right? Because otherwise it's just this delightful horror that we face. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Um, Yoni Mati, was there another? I see your hand. Your, yeah, your, I could, I, your, your I real hand. On. Yes, could, please. Um, and there's nobody else at the moment, please. Yeah, I, I was going to ask about the that aspect, but now it's a follow-up question. Um, this chaos view um, that we organize the past, and I think um, we find it in in Hayden White and in Anker Schmidt, and you you committed to. Um, I guess the, the what, what I'm wondering now here is whether this is actually a metaphysical that the past is not there's no inherent structure and therefore it always someone needs to impose a structure of some kind um but is it also or is that is that it's a metaphysical but is it also more or less an empirical view because i mean it, it is really the case that the historians approach the the past uh, they see that's a chaotic field and then they impose a narrative or or colligations or Gestalt tools or something like that, um, and if you think about some, some, I guess they are phenomenologists or phenomenal narrativists. Too. David Karst and others say that no, it's always, it's always narrativized already. You don't need any narrativizes. What would you say? Yeah. Um, so I mean, if you want to say that, you know, use the metaphysical idea as this umbrella concept in which you have, you know, different ways that you could have a metaphysical claim, one being, you know, anti-realism, then sure, <laughs> it is a metaphysical claim, right? The idea that there is no past or there is no structure or sure. Um, and, you know, uh, the idea that as, as you said, Carr or other people would suggest like, no, there is actually a structure there. We only discover it, right? Or historians simply just discover that structure. Doesn't really allow us to explain a lot of things that actually happen in the historical discipline, right? So the idea that we have multiple interpretations about a particular historical event, how does that, why does that happen, right? So Carr needs to give us an explanation of why is it that we have many different interpretations? So one explanation could be one of them is right and the other ones are wrong, right? But why think that reality is just in one way, right? Why, why have that commitment? So right now, for example, I'm, I'm exploring last year here in Mexico or two years ago, actually, we celebrate, it was the commemoration of the conquest, right? The Spanish conquest. And historians, you know, went crazy in trying to reinterpret this event because for 500 years, we have understood it as a conquest. Someone, someone came and conquered us, right? And now there's many different interpretations that say, was it really a conquest? What, what, why, why don't we change the idea? Why don't we play with the idea that it was rather an invasion, rather in, instead of conquest, let's call it uh, resistance, right? And so these different new ideas are going to change the meaning, right, of that past. And so in a way, they're going to produce a novel interpretation of that past. And Carr wouldn't, like, the, the thing with Carr is that it, he falls short in allowing us to understand why actually does that happen, right? Okay, thank you. Um, is there any follow-up questions or, or any other questions? Me? We can. You still, you, you still have a question? Me? 
I, I can go with one. If... Well, I could also ask one more thing. We can. Well, maybe we both we both say something, and then Mariana has the last word. We, yeah. we can do it that way, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then, again, mine like the last two are not very thought out because I sort of do that on the fly now because I, I thought I would be the moderator. But um, the point is the point is this: um, maybe I'm sort of phenomenologically challenged, but I am not sure I approach the past. Mm -hmm in any sublime way. And I'm not sure historians do that with the caveat when they work as historians. Um, and again, this is a very specific view, but I guess, I mean, when, 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 when historians look at the evidence or whatever there is, the remnants of the past, whatever you call that, is it that they are overwhelmed by what well, well, the Kantian understanding of the past, that they're feeling very small and, and sort of but, I mean, powerless, but in a positive way, not in a negative way, or often a positive way. Is that, is that really the case? And, um, and then it, 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 turned, it goes a bit back to what Yoni Mati said before, not necessarily with Ka, but that we always approach, that the historians always approach with a framework. Right? It's not like that. They look at remnants of the past as, as if I was, I'm not walking through some kind of rainforest and if I happen upon something the first time I've never seen before and I really don't know what it is, but I do know it's human made. So I, somewhere I'm in awe in front of it and I can really cannot make heads or tails of it. But historians usually, I mean, they, they, they start historiography and they, they, they work in a field that they're interested in. So they have, they, have, they have a mindset, they have a framework, they have thesis usually as well, I suppose. And with that, they approach other historians and the evidence or the traces of the past. So is the phenomenologically that sort of um, sublime? And if there isn't, would it be a huge problem? Well, I guess that's the question, thanks. And we, I know you said, no, Yoni Mati, please. Unless uh, it's something totally different. And... Uh, well, I, well it's, it's completely different, actually. Okay, well, let's, let's stick to my plan. And you, then you and then Mariana has the last word. Yeah. Uh, Yoni Mati? Yeah, yeah, you, oh, sorry. Okay, oh, I, I try to correct my thoughts. So um, it relates to E.P. Thompson's case yeah. and actually not a devisation again. And I think it's because, you know, I also read it and wrote about it earlier. And it's an interesting case to think about uh, what, what, or not, what not a devisation actually is and where is it needed and what is it needed for? Uh, just to sort of um, think about it. Um, when, when, when you raise up the issue of class consciousness emerging, on its own, by its own making, as, as the E.P. Thompson says. Um, and you uh, sort of um, present the E.P. Thompson as using a narrative to produce his view. So if I give you two, two different uh, notions, like the mode of presentation, the mode of presentation would be narrativization. But if I give you another, like a disciplinary rational, and now my question is, um, does the mode of presentation in history always have to be a narrative? Can it mm. be something else? Mm. Whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and in separation of that, um, what is the sort of dis disciplinary rationale that I'm thinking about what historians are? Why are they writing? Why are they doing the stuff they do? And here my view has been that they're trying to, let's say in P. Thompson's cases would be, you know, prove this case that class consciousness emerged by its own making. So that, that's really a rational making thing. That's all he wants to say. He wants to prove whatever way, whatever means he has to say this. And now, uh, but is it your, in your mind, is it also the discipline rational is to tell a narrative? In my guess, it's just to put this proposal forward. Um, and yes. I have one follow up, maybe, but maybe I can stop here. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to start with the, the phenomenology question, and then I'm going to move uh, from there to the, to the Thompson case. So the idea is that um, I, I, I'm, I'm sort of drawn to, to talk about my own experience because I, I, I you know, I did my bachelor's in history, actually, and um, every time that I had to go to the archive, it was just this, this feeling of, you know, anxiety and just being completely overwhelmed, right? And here, the, the National Historical I Archive is in, a, is in what was a prison complex, so it really just feels like you're entering a prison to, to you know, research the past. Um, but one of the things that 
you know, recently happened to me in, in a more narrow way was doing my PhD dissertation and Hyde and White's archive was just open to the public. And so I, I went to take a look to the archive and the person, uh, the librarian just pull out one box, right? Just one. It was, I think the, the archive is like 60. And in just one box, right, I open it and it was just like, so many folders that had no structure whatsoever with one and the other, right? One of them was talking about Gestalt psychology and, and had like White's drawings and try to like connect that to other stuff. There was like napkins with recipes and notes and it was just so incredibly overwhelming, right? And it was just one box. And the idea was that you know, it's not just one box, but how is this box connected to the other 70 box that are in the, in the archive? And how are these 70 box sort of like telling us something about Hayden White's work, right? So even just in one box, there was just this complete feeling of how is this fit, fitting together? How does this all make sense, right? And I think that's the question. That question is, is what is sort of making evident that the feeling of sublimity is sort of there, right? How is it that I can encompass this in one unitary whole, right? How is it that I can give meaning in one whole to everything that I'm looking at, right? And so in this way, I, I, I sort of say, no, yeah, the, the sublimity is present even in one box, right? Even in one box. And the idea about the framework, um, of course, you know, of course, I, I wouldn't say anything against that. I would say, yes, historians always go with a framework in mind. But sometimes, you know, um, I mean, Ginsburg talks about this in several interviews when he first encountered the archive of Minocchio and he read about, you know, this person saying that the universe was created uh, out of rotten matter. He first read that and said, this is fabulous, but right now I'm studying something else. And he left that outside for 10 years. And then he came back to it, right? With a new framework and a different framework. And we could say, right, we could agree that frameworks are always there, but you know, Elizabeth Camp in, in epistemology and the field of epistemology cites a bunch of people that right now I can't recall, right? With really contemporary work, uh, that argue that you know frameworks are something that we need to move beyond, right? Particularly in science, like frameworks are these sort of um, lenses that distort reality in a particular way, right? So there's this really realist commitment that you don't need frameworks, right? Get rid of them. Just look at reality, plain and simple. They they don't tell us a story of how that is done, right? But that's sort of the aim. And so the idea of just recalling that frameworks and aspects are necessary is also sort of pushing back against this realist position that we need to get rid of frameworks. It's rather, no, we need to understand them and see how they actually allow us to construct knowledge, right? And so moving uh, towards the, the Thompson question, what I would say is, um, Yes, I would have a strong position about narratives and historical explanations, saying that historical explanations sort of need narratives, right? Why? Because most of the times what they're trying to do is tell us how something came to be the case, right? So in, in Thompson's book in particular, he's trying to really convey the idea that class consciousness wasn't just created, right? But it was a, a historical process in which people were sort of aware that something was happening, right? That something was being created. But the, like the, the, the amazing part of this book is to, to show how that actually came to be, right? So it's telling, and to do that, it's telling us a story to show us how that came to be. It's not just, you know, this umbrella aspect, it's actually binding all of these different parts together to show us how that class consciousness or how he is even understanding class consciousness, right? So yeah, I would have like a strong position and say, 
I mean, you would have to give me a counter example and say, look, look at this historical explanation. This is not a narrative and we can discuss it, right? And see why, why wouldn't it be a narrative? But if you take my idea of Gestalt principles and say that narratives are informed by Gestalt principles and see how they are in play, then I would argue, I would say that basically all historical explanations are narratives or need narratives to show us how or why that conclusion, you know, the wanting of the Middle Ages, for example, how that conclusion came to be met. I don't know if that, if that answers the, the question. Um, I don't know either. Thank you. I mean, I mean, we, we, we said we will close off this, but do you want to give another counter example, Yoni Mati, if you want to? I mean, otherwise we, we close now. No, 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 I, I don't have a counter. I, I just, for, for, for the last I mentioned in your paper, I recently read, I think it was interesting. You referred to Bur Burkhardt and yes. he, he says something along the lines that the, the earlier event is necessary for the later event. I think yes. this would give a great cognitive explanation for it, why narrative is needed if it's needed. Yes, yes. Just that yes. I think that, that's the most forceful thing that I can think of. Yes. All right. Thank you very much. We can, unless Mariana wants to say something, still we, 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 we end on this note. Um, I thank you all very much for joining and I thank especially Mariana for her talk. And uh, I hope I see most of the times in two weeks time, most of you in two weeks time at our next, next talk. Bye-bye. Thank you.